please, the word is yours. Thank you so much. Let's see. Microphone working? All right. I'm going to set a timer here for myself. And start. 45 minutes. All right. Um, I'm terrible at, at planning when I start talking about something. So, hi, I'm, I'm Peter Magnuson. Uh, I'm going to try to um, leave some room for, for questions at the end, but um, if I get too excited about the topic and get carried away and burn through my time, then I'm available after the, the seminars uh, at noon upstairs, I think. Let's see if I can figure this out. Did I fail right away? No, there we go. Yeah, I got, yeah, I'm an American corporation, so safe harbor statement, although I'm not really going to be talking much about, about uh, Oracle products today. Uh, am I doing something wrong here? Is there an engineer in the house? There. Oh, it's there. that button. Though. All right. So we'll see. You just have to press a little bit just have to harder. press a little bit harder. All right. Um, so, ceci ne pas un nuage. So this is not a cloud. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a specific aspect of cloud today. Um, the cloud means a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, at Oracle today, it's gotten uh, fairly confusing because everything we do is apparently cloud. Uh, so, so we need some nomenclature within that um, to figure out what's going on. Um, so yes, I'm originally a, a sixer over. I, I was at six 20 years ago. And when I was thinking about what to talk about today, I was thinking back to, um, to a, a presentation that um, Stephanopoulos did at six many years ago. Oh, are you going to sleep on me here, buddy? Um, who was then a CTO at then Sun Microsystems. And he was here for, for an event and gave a talk on Sun Microsystems, was a company that used to make large servers. They still do. They're now Oracle. Um, and at the time, way back when, quarter century ago, oh my god, um, the big problem, or one of the big problems in computer science was parallel computer architectures and how to build those parallel systems and what programming models to have and so forth. And there was a bit of a... Um, sort of philosophical uh, split in the computer architecture community where the bulk of research was being done using uh, scientific workloads, using engineering workloads. And the main driver of that was two things. One was that academic institutions would generally have closer access to those algorithms and those projects and those companies. Um, partly because of research programs that other parts of the universities would have. Um, but the other problem, the other one was a practical one. I don't know if you've heard the, the joke about the drunk man who's looking for his car keys under a street lamp and the police officer asks, is this where you dropped it? He said, no, I dropped it over there, but it's dark there. I can't see a thing, so I have to look over here. Um, because that's the, that's the workloads that the research groups had access to source code for. Um, so they were able to use that source code to build models of next generation computers. And there was, a, there was a couple of research groups, including at six, that disagreed with that approach because most of parallel computers that were actually being sold were not in HPC market, high performance computing. Um, it was for commercial workloads, notably database workloads, transaction processing, data warehousing, business intelligence workloads. Um, and for Stephanopoulos, this was an eye-opener because he was coming from MIT, was coming from Thinking Machines. I think he was a co-founder. Um, so when he started working as CTO for Sun Microsystems, he realized that database workloads are, are completely different in their memory patterns and in in, in, in what they require of the system. And um, one of the reasons that Sun Microsystems was successful in those days was because they aligned themselves um, with database workloads, with commercial workloads. Um, that then became, that influenced me a lot because that was part of my, I, my research interest was to build simulators that could do amongst other things that, which became our startup. Um, and today there's something, so it struck me when I was thinking about coming here and 
course, talking about cloud in general, that there's an analogous um, split that people aren't really talking about, and that is um, the difference between consumer-oriented cloud workloads and enterprise-oriented cloud workloads. Um, so we're kind of repeating the same pattern. Uh, and of course, when, it's, when events are 20 years apart, everyone's always forgotten the lessons from the last one and starting all afresh, uh, which is why you notice that if you look at the frequencies of financial crises, they have like a 25-year, 20, a 50-year, or 75-year cycles, sort of like sunspots, because that's about the generations that people die off and, and, and retire, and so the, the, the experience from the previous round is gone. Um, but I'm still working, and I remember that phase. So that's roughly what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I, let's see. There we go. I did this diagram in 2009. I included it because I was curious about uh, if it was still applicable. Did I just hit the B button? Something else happened. Was that me? Yes, it was. Yeah, I've clearly been, a, I've, been a, I've been away from hands-on technology for way too long. I just stand and talk in front of people. I don't do anything useful anymore. Um, so this, this, I did this uh, diagram and uh, blog posting about it in 2009, because right around then I was doing a sort of mid-career shift. I wanted to do something different um, and, and ended up in this area that was, became known as cloud. Is it, I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. This, the guy in the, in, the, in the visible pants is fixing things. Are we, are we good here? We're good? So it's, it's in the house. I, I'm calling a guy. You're calling a guy. All right. You're calling. He's calling a guy. All right. Going to call a guy who's going to fix this. All right. See how that goes. I can go with a black screen, too. Um, and the way I saw it then was that there was four generations of, that this was a, I, I was trying to understand whether the, the, the cloud shift was an incidental shift or whether it was a fundamental shift in technology. Everything is always a paradigm shift, but you have to ask yourself if it really is. And I concluded it was and sort of began working in that space um, ever since. Um, and the way I sim simplified it here was that in the 1940s, you had the notion of a computer that you went to with a job to be done, a stack of punched cards or something. The next big innovation was that you didn't actually physically have to be right by the computer. You can be running these workloads um, remotely, but you, you weren't really doing anything on the local. It was just a terminal. Um, but it was a lot easier than having to physically be next to the machine. Um, the 1980s, what we might also know as, as, as internet today, but the general notion of having a peer-to-peer -peer environment where you've got uh, systems talking to systems over networking, um, the principle being that you, you have some capabilities of running things locally and you can be getting things remotely. And then the, the cloud, um, the original thing that Eric Schmidt meant when he referenced cloud was the notion of small little applets running inside a sort of compute environment against a common set of data. Um, but it was the full loop where we're centralizing again. So you're basically putting a data center. The data center is the computer. In fact, a cluster of data centers um, is your computer. Um, when, you, when new systems are being built now, we think multi-data multi center, not even a, a single data center. Um, where you have the data, you have massive amounts of data of various types uh, residing across these data centers, and then you make it very, very easy to write code um, that, that interacts against it. However, when people talk about cloud, they're often talking about um, flavors of hosting, of outsourced hosting, and flavors of hosting higher up in the stack. So if you're a developer starting, if you're starting a startup, you're, you're, you know, your classical option is that you do it in your garage, which point you own every single, every single level there. Um, your next step to outsourcing is that you rent the server. Your next step after that is that, you, um, that you're running on somebody else's computer and someone else's colo. 
The next step up from that is that you're running on something that's fully managed, something Heroku style. And the next step up from that is that um, you run your application on top of a, a full abstraction platform such as App Engine. There's actually one level, one additional level to the right there that I guess I should add, which is that you're just running against somebody else's application, um, which is also known as software as a service. So those, those uh, sort of stages or that that spectrum of, of outsourcing, um, today we kind of bucket it into infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. Um, and we do it in a very confusing manner, right? So Salesforce positions itself as a cloud company, but it doesn't run its software in any sort of way that is really cloud at all. Uh, it's more like very, very large Oracle systems and where they do a lot of innovations on top of that. Um, the, real, the real innovation there is on the, and, and, and similar companies like them, um, is in the notion of taking an enterprise grade application and, and, and changing the distribution channel of it. Um, our company, Virtutech, was an early customer of Salesforce in the Nordic region, actually. And at the time, you had a choice if you wanted a serious uh, CRM system, customer relationship management system, you had either nothing or you. Um, you spent a quarter million dollars on some hardware and some Oracle licenses and some CRM licenses. And what the SaaS companies did was they figured out how to weigh, how to, ways of doing multi-tenant versions of this so you can pay per user. Um, so th those are really moving something from being a capex to being an opex or being a, an incremental thing. So they, they in turn fall into metered services where you're paying for amount of resources you're using or they fall into uh, subscription base where you pay per user or something like that. Um, but whether or not that is built on something that is a cloud system at all in the modern sense of the cloud architecture where Eric Schmidt was referencing is really completely orthogonal. So, so it gets a little bit confused. Um, and I'm going to confuse it further by, by talking about um, the, there's the black thing there. By talking about the cloud consumer type of cloud and the cloud enterprise type of cloud. Um, a lot of the conversations and interest in cloud comes from the innovations and architectural work that have come out of places like Yahoo, Google, uh, Facebook, um, and, and, and their ilk, which translates into things like Hadoop and MapReduce and, and um, things like Elastic Compute and things like that. Um, because these companies had a very particular set of requirements that was different from what the computational, what, what the computer market could provide at the time. Um, a very important sort of uh, event was when, when eBay crashed, I think it was 98, 97, the former Sun employees here will remember which, which year that was. Um, because eBay was running on, on Sun and Oracle systems. Um, and they crashed. And at the time, I knew some of the guys that swept in from the Sun Microsystems SWAT team to figure out what was going on. Their assessment was that eBay didn't know what they were doing. Um, they were just buying hardware, connecting it up, never doing proper configuration, never doing proper administration, not using it correctly. So that was a takeaway that that Sun took from it, um, which is why Sun subsequently had problems. Because eBay's takeaway, and Google's takeaway, and Yahoo's takeaway, was that actually we can't use those machines. We can't use those software stacks for our use case. Uh, it just doesn't work. So they started building their own stuff. Um, and that led to a bifurcation in this sort of computer architecture work where those cloud-based, consumer-based systems went on a separate path for about 15 years. And it's not kind of coming together. And what they needed was systems that were very, very easy to scale horizontally, where it was very easy just to add more hardware, add more disks incrementally without having to reconfigure things or change things. And in turn, you needed to be able to do that without modifying the applications and so forth. Um, and they discovered over several years how to do this, what was the appropriate uh, way of doing this, 
Now looking back with 10 years hindsight, we can look back and see it at see sort of uh, have better visibility into what was it that wasn't working with the with with the that at the time enterprise approach to the new flavor of, of consumer workloads. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. And the significance of talking about this is that if you're doing research and if you're doing new development, you're not going to have any impact in the consumer space because those companies are doing all that development themselves. And that approach to it is not going to work in the enterprise space for the same reasons that uh, compu parallel computers that were optimized for Linpack or something was not particularly relevant for running a database. So, what these consume, and, and again, th this stuff is obvious now after having had 15 years to think about it. Um, it was sure as heck not obvious in 1998. So, the consumer sh cloud is something that's, that's very specific. It's a very specific way of building a system um, on which to run your application. First of all, you want to use common off-the-shelf components. You just want to throw in Linux x86 servers. You have a workload that is fundamentally latency tolerant. So if it takes 100 milliseconds to get a response from, let's say something, let's take something random, Snapchat on your phone, um, it talks to the server, it asks some questions, it wants, wants the user to log in, or it wants to get an update on stories. If the response comes back within 100 milliseconds, that's typically fine. Uh, what's important is that if you have 100 million people making a similar question within a 30-minute period, they can all get a response. In other words, you need to build a system for aggregate throughput as opposed to specific speed. Um, your, your SLA, your service level agreement, or your implied reliability of this, 99% is fine. Um, if your Facebook web page hangs on every 100th refresh, you're not even going to notice it. You're going to blame or whatever, your local vendor, you're going to blame some other setup. You're not going to blame, um, uh, you're not going to blame the, the vendor, and, and they don't care. Um, the application space of the developers, say Facebook developers or Google developers, is extremely narrow. There's very, very few, very, very few actually applications. Um, Facebook recently shared on a panel that I was in that across all of their data centers, they run 50 applications. That's it. Over millions of cores, 50 apps. I estimate that less than 1,000 apps constitute 80% of the entire $200 billion digital advertising entertainment space. That's it for the whole marketplace. Um, furthermore, your, your cost, the cost of the system that you're running on it's not an overhead cost. It's a cost of goods sold, which means it's part of what you're selling. If you need more hardware, that's because you're getting more customers, and that's a good thing, as opposed to IT costs for enterprise, where it's an overhead. Um, your gross margins are high. It's a very different kind of model that you're selling. Agility is what's important. If you look on the specifics on how Facebook and Google build their data centers, they're actually making them very, very expensive, in a very, very expensive, a very, very inefficient way because they're maximizing something else. They're maximizing the speed with which they can write the 51st application to run across those data centers. That's way more important. Um, so things like MapReduce, for example, if you actually do the math on it versus something like an optimized data warehouse uh, hardware, is super inefficient, but it's very, very easy to use. It's very easy to scale up to a million cores. Um, more technically, on the finance side, um, your price to sale multiple of your business is higher. Uh, internet multiplier is typically seven times your sales, which means that if you're getting more users, which is driving more sales, for which you have to buy more hardware, your commensurate market value of your company is going up much quicker than a typical enterprise company's multiplier would go up. And this really matters, because it really ties into your ability to to capitalize. Um, the longevity of your apps is very short. Generally, you need to be very effective and competitive in your app development for like five years. After that, you've either won the marketplace or you've lost it. If you won it, you don't really have to improve it much more because you've already crushed the competition, which is why you see all these older consumer-oriented apps that aren't really improving a heck of a lot. 
um, because they don't really care. And the developers can be extremely expensive, and you can afford it for the reasons that are above. Now let's compare this with enterprise, right? First of all, they're built out of premium components, and it'll be obvious why shortly. The systems are typically latency intolerant, because you typically have systems talking to systems, right? So you have Wells Fargo running a large banking system. Every single transaction has to be, tra has to be handled very, very fast, because everything has to be serialized. Moving money between accounts has to be very, very, very strictly serialized. You can't do an approximation of it. Um, you have a vast suite of software. Across the, uh, across the um, say, 10,000 10, largest companies in the world, um, I'd estimate that there's over 10 million different applications that are running in these systems. So you're talking about three, maybe four orders of magnitude more diversity of applications. Um, the cost of building and running these apps is a pure overhead for most cases. These are not revenue-driving apps. They're supportive apps. They're supportive software. Your gross margins are generally tighter because you're not operating in the tech space. You are using tech to operate in retail or manufacturing or whatever. Um, your, your price to sales multiples, your ability to capitalize is much more narrow. The longevity of your applications is insane. It's like decades. It's, you know, some of these things have been running for upwards of half a century. And your developers are, 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 are regular people. Um, you can't be hiring out of the top 5%. You need to be hiring out of the normal middle 60%, you know, perfectly fine programmers, but they're not the elite of the elite. And you don't pay them half a million dollars in stock per year or more. Um, you know, a, 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 senior, a senior top developer in Silicon Valley with eight years of experience um, can make a million dollars a year. Right? So you, that doesn't scale into corporate worldwide. You wish, right? But, uh, well, some of you wish and some of you don't. There's both sides in here, right? So maybe this is, a, this is, this is a food for fodder for your next union conversations here. Uh, let's see here, I'm not doing it on time. So let's look at one example here. Um, I'll look at the, I'll take one, I'll take a, one simple sort of engineering example, then I'll take one simple business example. So if your availability of your system is 99% versus 99.99%, let's just define SLA in this case as um, a feature that is being used is executing correctly. Um, so imagine a consumer app, a Facebook app, or WhatsApp, or, or something like that, that there's a new feature, and it requires 50,000 cores to run versus the 200 million users that are out there. That's a pretty standard number, by the way. Um, it's insane how much systems these things require. If your SLA is 99%, that means literally 500 of your servers can die in the middle of that request, and it doesn't matter because right, you're running at such scale. That's why you can build the consumer architectures out of consumer grade off the shelf systems, because if they break and the power, um, the, pow the power supplies blow up or the hard drives die, as long as you're on average losing less than about one or 2% of what's going on, it doesn't matter. Um, now, even a large enterprise app needs less than 100 cores. That's a large one. There's not a lot of those. Um, with four nines, and four nines isn't even very high, right, for an enterprise use case. If you're a banking system, four nines is not going to cut it. You need better than that. That means, very simply, statistically, not a single one of those servers can flake out. So if you want a system that's tolerant for them to flake out, then you have to start doing multiple systems being involved, active, active, and so forth. And then you start getting into much more complicated architectures. If you have a simple horizontal cloud architecture, it simply does not work. You cannot do that on a, simple, uh, uh, on a simple system. I encountered this like the hard way when I was running App Engine at Google, because Google internally was trying to use App Engine as much as possible for all the internal IT development, um, HR systems and things like that. And they had a devilish time partly for things like this, because if you have a, 
if you have a system where you're registering, you know, somebody's wage increase or a promotion, you can't have a 2% error rate. You know, oh, this person got fired instead of promoted. Oops, you know, that, that, that doesn't work, right? Uh, whereas if you're, playing, if you're playing Clash of Clans and, and it screws up and loses your upgrade, you're gonna, get, you're gonna have a pissed off person posting on the app feedback, but you really don't care a, a, as a vendor. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, so let's look at a different one. So that one was uh, that was about as engineering oriented I'm going to get today. Sorry, guys. Here's more business. Um, so bear with me here. If you uh, if you are new to the world of consumer apps, this is all going to be uh, Greek, uh, but it's it's fun to know. Um, so the market cap, the investor value of like a consumer application is roughly on the order of $100 per monthly active user. MAU is a monthly active user. Let's say that one monthly active user corresponds to about a half daily active user. That's a pretty typical um, sort of industry number. Let's say that any particular daily active user um, hits your servers with 500 uh, queries per day. Let's say that a server you got running can handle 10,000 queries per minute. Um, usually they're, they're stateless read, 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 but that includes a bunch of, of state modifying uh, queries. Now, even if most of these users have a pretty dense you know, access pattern, um, 100 queries per user during a single hour, that means a single server can handle 600,000 queries per hour, which means a single server can handle 6,000 users during that hour. Um, now, that means 3,000 monthly active users, that's $300,000 worth of value in the company, right? So if you were to take Facebook's market cap divided by MAUs and then divide that number to servers, you would start getting numbers like this. Now your server probably costs 10 or $20,000, which means that if you're getting traffic that requires you to add 10 more servers, do you think you care what those servers cost or how inefficiently you're using them? You don't. All you care about is your ability to add those servers really quickly, because the thing you don't want to do is have those users not get a good user experience of your app. So you're oriented towards scalability, not reliability. And engineering is always about trade-offs. Which is just what I said. Whereas for, for enterprise, it's kind of the opposite, right? A lot of transactions, a lot of, uh, of, 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 of traffic is, is like a nuisance. They try to reduce it. Um, you don't make money on it, right? So the number of queries that the, an airline booking system gets, they don't make money on it unless you're actually buying a ticket. Um, and you can see these, you can see the discrepancy. I picked the airline thing because it's a very good example. If you're a user of kayak.com or one of these meta search engines, um, it's a consumer grade app which means it's very fast, it's very fancy, it's very clever, easy to use. They keep adding features to it. It's always very innovative. As soon as you click the button, okay, let me book this ticket, it's probably talking to an Oracle system because it's going over to the airline company. And if you've done a lot of travel, then you know that the SLA there is at most 98%. Because every so often it says, oh, tickets in that class aren't available. Oh, that flight's not available, yada, yada, yada. So they're specifically arbitraging this difference, right? So the back-end system can't be that flaky. It has to say, yes, there's a seat. Yes, this flight actually exists on that day and at this price, right? So the consumer approach is like saying, well, if you want to travel somewhere, you should send 20 people on four different airlines. At least 15 will get there. That's, that's, that's like the consumer approach. The enterprise approach is I'm sending my CIO to a conference and he better be there at 8 a.m., right? Or he's gonna miss the lecture, right? And you, that translates into two very different transportation system optimizations. So um, uniformity really comes, comes in play here, right? So this looks pretty uniform, right? It's just a random data center picture I took. Um, and it's uniform because of the economics of the application. And this is a generic system thing. So it looks like that, right? This is cornfields in Iowa. Um, it's a monospecific ecosystem. There's just one species there. That's it. It's got one, it, and they're probably genetically modified. So probably one type of DNA. That's it of that whole thing. 
which is very economical and it's very scalable. If you want to add a couple of more acres to that, you don't have to do a lot of thinking about it, right? Um, and it's the same principle because the DNA is the app, right? There's just one thing that you want to run and you're optimizing everything around it. Um, I was thinking of putting in a picture, but the sort of enterprise equivalent is the Amazon rainforest, right? Where you've got just an insane number of species of different sizes and shape and nooks and crannies. And your strategies for, 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 for doing it, doing things is very different. Let's go back. Uh, so enterprise architectures are not uniform, like anything but uniform. Um, they're horribly non-uniform. Black, black and blue is pretty uniform, all right. So, ah, oh dear, dear. This is clearly a consumer-oriented system that's being built here. Uh, all right. So, and with those slides, I wasn't even trying hard to point out all the differences, right? So if we dig a little deeper, um, consumer environment, Typically, all the developers have root access. You have eight startup engineers, and they can do anything anywhere. Well, that works really, really badly in lots of enterprise environments. You have very detailed role management. Consumer apps and consumer grain generally have very, very simple business logic. Um, the scale in and of itself can be a challenge, and designing good products uh, is a challenge, and sometimes some of the underlying things like a search algorithm or face recognition can be really hard. But the business logic is not. There's not, whereas, whereas in, in, the, in the enterprise case, they can be crazy. You can have, you know, a single enterprise apps can have thousands of input forms defined that all have to connect together in a certain way. Um, the, consumer, the consumer approach is, is, is fly by night, right? You just throw it out there and then you wait to get sued if you're doing something wrong. Because your, your plan is to get big enough so you can afford the lawyers as quickly as possible. That's not explicitly the model, but that's de facto, uh, that's de facto the model. Whereas enterprises, when they do a new app, they do it as a part of an existing business, right? So they're generally under a massive amount of, a massive amount of regulatory oversight, like a lot. Um, a, multi, a large multinational that is operating across the whole world is easily susceptible to over a hundred different legal jurisdictions. States, provinces, countries, and so forth. Um, a very, very important thing that people forget is that the consumer, the definition of what the consumer app is, is completely defined by the vendor. Right? So if you get the wrong search results on a Google page, Google doesn't care. They just need to be better than Bing. Right? That's, that's all they care about. And if you're buying ads there, then, I mean, they try to make it as good as possible, right? I mean, I'm not slamming them for doing a bad job. It's just the fundamentals is that they define what constitutes correct on that page. So does Facebook. You know, so do all of these, right? Um, if you get a particular stream of events on Twitter, you haven't defined what the algorithms are, what the business rules are for choosing what thing to do. It's whatever they decide to do. So if anything is wrong, they're the ones that are negotiating with themselves. You don't have a recourse. They don't have to live up to your requirements. Um, related to that is if something breaks, you roll it back, you maybe you apologize, you point everybody to an end user license which promises nothing. Uh, it's pretty much caveat emptor across the board. Whereas if you're in the enterprise space, it's a completely different universe. Um, if something breaks, that probably always means that you lose money. It might very well mean you lose your job. It could easily mean that your company's dead. So it's very, very different. Um, the developer thing I already mentioned. Security also is another whole big area, right? So with, again, with consumer apps, security is something that you address after you start having problems. It's always the case. Every single successful consumer play that I've seen have always dealt with security after they've had breaches, after they've had problems. Again, because they're 
modus operandi is to get big as quickly as possible so that they can afford to fix whatever they need to fix uh, and pay off whatever class actions lawsuits they need to they need to do right whereas enterprise you can't do that right you can't do incremental additions to your business and just say well for my order management system next year i'm not going to care about security for the first four years because it slows us down right you can't quite do that um and finally i wanted to mention some numbers here. Um, so on the left, I think this is uh, Forrester data. On the left is the entire US digital marketing uh, business. It's on the order of $60 billion a year now. The global business is about twice that. Um, so that includes everything. That is uh, search advertising, that's social media, email, which is a frighteningly big business still. Um, display advertising, um, that's the whole market. And all the consumer players pretty much fight over this money, all of them. Right? So Facebook, Google, Snapchat, Twitter, uh, Apple's apps, not their devices, um, all fight over the same market. Now, the, now the, the diagram on your right is the global tech business, that's global. So the numbers on the left, you should roughly double to get the global number. There's hardly a segment that's as small as the entire US digital advertising marketplace, right? Um, this one, and this one doesn't even include telco, right? So telco is another trillion dollar in change. You know, what's a few hundred billion dollars between friends? Uh, I actually don't remember the telco number to a precision of the entire size of the of the digital marketing space, which is 60 billion. I don't remember the telco number with an accuracy of 60 billion. Right? Um, so you add one, one trillion and change, it's, it's, all, it's, it's going on four trillion dollars in size. Um, and what that means is that, but you, of course you've heard about the consumer apps a lot. And the reason that you've heard about it is because every single dollar on the left is spent on your attention. It's all advertising, which is why you've heard about it, because advertising works, right? So obviously an industry that, spent, that, that you see $100 billion worth, you will be very aware of as a consumer, as a citizen. The business on the right are the people that actually make everything work, right? They build this thing, that ship these boxes, that get the electricity in here, all the clothes you're wearing, the cars you're driving, the seats you're sitting on, the food you're eating, everything else, right, is, is, is supported by the IT spend on the right. And that IT spend is adopting cloud technology like now at a pretty quick pace. A lot of what they're importing and they're trying to import straight off is let's take the experiences from the consumer space and then just throw it into the enterprise space. And they're already starting to begin to notice how that doesn't work. So I've, I've been in more than one meeting now with large Oracle customers that started adopting you know, elastic computing and things like that. I'm not going to say from whom. Um, and then they try to run the workloads that they want to run from Oracle, and they can't. And they come to us, and they say, how do we run this? And we're like, well, you can't, <laughs> right? Because you can't. It's, you need to have an engineered system. You need to have a whole system that can run it. So nobody, nobody is running their mission-critical enterprise systems on public consumer clouds today, not a single customer. And all of the big SaaS players, Microsoft, Salesforce, uh, Google, their financial emission critical systems internally are Oracle systems, almost 99%. Um, so you're gonna start getting this discrepancy and it's a very close parallel to when we started getting distributed computing going into enterprise mainstream. The solution ended up ended up being uh, shared memory multiprocessors, right? Um, because that was, a, on that you could run enterprise workloads. Uh, and you're gonna have a similar shift now. So there are things in, there are things in, uh, in the cloud space that, that will translate. There are things in the cloud space that will translate. There are uh, aspects of DevOps, there are aspects of agility, there's aspects of having layered systems and, and having um, corporate-wide sort of underlying services on which you build your services. Um, there are aspects that translate, um, but they're not going to translate just unchanged and, and straight up. And 
which is why I have the day job I have, because that's exactly the problem that I work with every day, um, which is to figure out uh, the clouds that we're building and other enterprise grade are building, uh, how should they look like. So here's a quote from me that I wrote last night. Um, <laughs> When we, when we talk cloud, we generally refer to the consumer cloud, um, but the enterprise cloud um, will be a very, very different beast. Thank you, and that gives five minutes for any QA. Thank you. We have two mics, right? We have one mic on each side? Yeah. Peter, um, isn't it... Safe. What a surprise you have a question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Things haven't changed in 25 years, huh? Okay, that's nice. That's nice. Very comforting. Yeah, it's great. No, but I can never get away from getting questions from Safe, right? That's, this is my life. No, no, but it's, it's very interesting. My first job at six was at, I used his office when he exactly. was on vacation. Yeah, so. so the first question from Safe I ever got was, what are you doing in my office? <laughs> Very good. No, no, just, just, isn't that just a question of uh, the current state of immaturity of the cloud technology? It will get better because remember also. No, 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 no. It's not a question of good and bad. Mm. Absolutely not. But let me tell you something. I mean. If that came across, then I did it. Be, the, the whole you remember the shared memory? They're different. They're different. You remember the shared scale yes. that we worked together? Yeah. Many companies move to use clusters, even for database application, not using shared memory, as the technology improved in cluster technology to build yeah. enterprise yeah. applications. Huh? Yeah. So this could be very well also the case with, with, with cloud environment. They are using just whatever is existing now. But what, they're cl what they cluster mm. are shared memory multiprocessors. Mm. Yeah, but still cluster. Yes, but it's a shared memory processor, that's the fundamental. Yeah, because the argument at the time was that your fundamental building block would be a s symmetric small compute unit. That did not become the basis of clusters. No. It was basically what the market ended up doing was you build as big a shared memory processor as you can, and, then you cluster and if that's not big enough, you cluster it. But that is not what the HPC, SIMD, all of that stuff was advocating. They were advocating just throw in 5,000 CPUs and they're all sort of distributed local memories and all that stuff, and that didn't work, right? So clusters just says that, well, the shared memory scaled to a certain level and then you cluster it. But that model then broke down because that's what eBay was trying to do. That's what these guys were trying to do. They were trying to do clusters of these guys, but the clustering does not work to 500 clusters. And then it didn't work. Oh, so right. you only get one question, say, if you have more questions here. <laughs> it took me a while, 20 years, to figure this out, but he gets one question. Uh, Hi. <clears throat> so I guess it comes down to um, cache coherency, consistency in data, and eventual consistency. So you have a, a sort of a model in the HPC <laughs> field where you're, you're looking for eventual consistency. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a time delta between that and the, the um, promise of consistency in the enterprise system. So I guess you're in that gray area of that uh, hybridization. What does that look like ne now? Is it miniaturization of the app stacks? Um, is it uh, shared state between client and server? Or is it still very much in the server space consistency? That's an excellent question. Um, uh, and, you know, I was mentioning to Christopher before how things were coming around. I had no idea I was going to have so much use for all that I had learned about eventual consistency and consistency models a long time ago, but it's all super relevant now when we're building these things. Um, what, what we're building, what, what we think is the right approach, um, is to approach consistency models in conjunction with the SLA model on a per-service basis. Right? So, for example, if you have an S3-like object store model of distributed blobs, well, if you define it as being immutable, then, it's, then you can have a global address base. So, so, as opposed to S3, Oracle's new object store system that we've rolled out has a global bucket 
uh, uh, address space. So if you become a corporate customer, your definition of a blob, there's just one such definition corporate-wide, and it'll migrate and get copied to whatever data center that you're accessing it. So that, there the consistency model is, well, if you, if you have a copy of it, that will be the copy. There's no in place, right? At the other end of the extreme, you might have something like a, an internal uh, quota system, which is checking, are you, you know, are you allowed to use this many CPU hours or this much space, and you need a, a quicker return on it? Well, there you can compensate some of the consistency problems with a slightly lower SLA. Because if you're wrong about it, all you did was consume hours for the customer that they had not approved, and then you might just throw that away, right? So, on a per ser so I think the, f the correct approach uh, is the microservice approach where you break up the services on which you build these systems into what the fundamentals are. A metadata store, an object store, uh, an account, uh, an account uh, sort of LDAP style directory. And for each one of those, you think through what is your contract with the user? What's your, what's your consistency model? And what's your availability model? Uh, and what are the API calls for that on a per service basis? Because it's really not, and what the scope is, right? So when we're looking at multi-data center setups, we'll have some services that are in the data center, there's some that's multi-data centers, there's some that's continent-wide, and then there's some that's global, and they will then translate into different types of, of consist consistency and SLA models, right? You can, for some of these services, it's okay to take 100 milliseconds to get an answer. For some, 0.1 milliseconds is too slow, right? So on a per service basis, you need to architect it differently. But it's a very interesting question. We'll take one more, I guess. Uh. Okay, I have a more uh, social question than on the society level. In my little world of one-man company, I'm asking myself in your uh, discussion about the collision of the consumer and the enterprise world. I, I see a world where the enterprise might disappear in the view we see today. Or it's, it's, more, it's more a question to you. And that the companies beco become more networks of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, individuals. That's the world I work in. You're working in a small network of, of experts, for example, or, and you sell your services. You don't need this huge uh, human resource uh, center yeah. because you handle it yourself. Yeah. Maybe you have a Bitcoin card you <laughs> can send it, whatever. So, do you see any trends? Do you believe in that we're building big enterprises or I think we need it maybe in the manufacturer. When you manufacture Volvo, it might be difficult that each guy or girl working there have their own um, enterprise. That's a, that's a Thank you for asking a, a sort of a, a different segue question as, as ending it. That's a really interesting question. Um, so the, I have lots of opinions about that, but I don't have, I'm a Bayesianist, so I always apply a sort of statistical reliability estimate to any opinion I have. Um, I have lots of opinions about that, but my, but my Gaussian charts are like spread on, on those opinions. I have no idea. Uh, because on the one hand, I'll, I'll mention just a few things. On the one hand, we've speculated about, you know, the death of the corporation since Karl Marx was sitting in the British Library opining about how the world should be organized. Um, and we've predicted this in the past, right? Uh, we predicted, I, I mean, I remember that we were having these discussions when the personal computer revolution happened, right? Because it was tacitly uh, believed that computation and if you got a distribution of your, of your ability to produce, right? So, you know, the first generation of, 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 of industrial revolution in late 18th century England for the big, um, you know, the big weaveries and things like that, they required the enormous machines because you needed a steam engine in your freaking building uh, to have any power. So the first belief of this distribution was with the invention of electricity. Back then in the 1800s, there was also a conversation about, oh, now everybody you know, is going to be their own manufacturer. And there was a period of time, for example, when the sewing machine 
was sold to households as a source of income for the housewife to locally be a manufacturer. And that lasted for a while, but then it all got replaced by Asian imports, right? Because that scale, uh, that we forget that that all got wiped out, but that was the belief of what was going to happen at the time. We had the same thing with personal computers, because at the time we thought, oh, you need um, big mainframes to be, and, you, and you have to have the, the critical mass to pay for it. Personal computers will change that. We're now starting to have, again, this conversation with 3D printers of, oh, now everybody can manufacture their own thing. It seems to me that we're always going through this. It's like asking the question whether you should have a, a distributed or a centralized organization, the best way to organize people. And it seems like we're always having this meta business cycle over the decades where it goes distributed, and then there's an innovation period where we figure out what it is we're doing with that distributed approach. And once we figure that out, we define the cookie cutter, and then we build a centralized corporation because it can just do it a lot better, right? And we're always having those swings. You know, once you've got the 3D printers going and we got this new business, someone's going to figure out what do people use it for. I'm going to build a factory that's got 800 of those and they're serviced by robots and my per gadget cost is going to be lower than these amateurs at home, right? Um, so I think w this is going to be yet one of those things because now with both the uh, uh, consumer cloud and the enterprise cloud, almost in particular the enterprise cloud, small innovators, small entrepreneurs will be able to more easily build sort of a real HR system for 40 employees, which you couldn't really do before. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll have this back and forth sort of all over again. You know, history repeats itself in various ways. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.